So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first Fuzz Age Expert Seminar. Today we'll have Peter, talk, uh, Peter Tompa, and the talk will be shared by Isabel Cardoso from IBMC. So Isabel, whenever you are ready, you can start, and thank you all for participating. Uh, thanks, Rita. Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you all to this expert seminar of the Fuzz Age project. Today's speaker is Peter Tompa, and before I introduce him, um, I just want to let you know that we'll have time for questions at the end of uh, his presentation um, of this uh, public open uh, part of, of the session, and we'll have about 10 minutes. And for that, we will use the chat. So please leave your questions in the chat. And then at the end, I will try to read your questions and uh, uh, Peter will try to address uh, all the doubts and, and questions. And now about the, the, the speaker. So it's a, a great pleasure to present Professor Peter Tompa, the group leader at the Center of the Structural Biology of the Flanders Institute of Biotechnology of the Bridge University of Brussels, also professor of biochemistry at the same university. And uh, Peter Tampa is among the pioneer researchers of intrinsically disordered proteins who played an active role in the development of this field. Since realizing that some proteins are intended to not have folder structures, uh, Professor Tampa has developed many concepts for understanding the disorder function relationships of these paradigm breaking uh, proteins that challenge the, the classical structure function paradigm and demand for studies aiming at characterizing and understanding this phenomenon in detail. And to find out that uh, disorder proteins carry out unique functions and that they play important roles in serious diseases such as cancer and neurodegeneration. More recently, uh, the focus of the lab turned to understanding the role of structural disorder in liquid-liquid phase separation um, of proteins in cell physiology and disease. And I think this is one of the main interests of the phase age. Uh, with a, a primary focus on ILS. Finally, Peter's lab is also interested in the structure function relationship of prote protein disorder for developing novel drug against imported, important disease related intrinsically disordered proteins. Uh, thanks for joining us today, uh, Professor Peter Tompa. I'm sure we'll learn a lot from you and whenever you're ready you can start i think uh, now i should say the screen is yours uh, thank you you have no sound uh, peter you have to turn on the sound sorry i was muted yeah, okay so i share my screen can you just uh, uh, confirm that you see my screen do you see yes, my screen? Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Let me put it like this. Okay. So uh, put in presentation mode and I begin. So good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending on where you are in the world. I'm sitting close to Brussels, not exactly in Brussels, but close to Brussels. I'm working, as we heard, uh, for the Free University Brussels and also for an organization <clears throat> that is called the Flanders Institute of Biotechnology which has the ambition of, of, of doing tech transfer, developing drugs based on discoveries. And the newest line of discoveries, of course, is, is uh, phase separation. <clears throat> and starting from disordered proteins, we have come or gone quite a long way to, to sort of contribute to this new field. And this is what I would like to very briefly outline. I thought of giving more of an introduction to the field than, than particular uh, um, results of the lab because FASAGE, the consortium just started and we are just formulating our plans about which way to go in this new field. 
So I will talk briefly about phase separation, also about protein disorder. Let me just take uh, laser pointer, yes. Uh, protein disorder, but, the, but the, sort of the central message of my, my talk will be this emergent function, that this is a new way of, of thinking about how proteins function, and I hope it will be clear by the end of my talk. So I start with this uh, beautiful uh, image that has been, I think, shown in, in mill almost millions of, of talks around the world that appeared like four years ago from, from Banani and also uh, Michael Rosen and um, um, Tony Hyman, I think, was in the paper that stated that the, in the cell is full of, that the cell is full of membraneless organelles, <clears throat> or we can call them biomolecular condensates or RMP, ribonucleoprotein bodies or liquid-liquid phase separation bodies or droplets. And the idea is here that as opposed to membranes surrounded organelles, these other organelles form without the involvement of membranes. And although they were discovered a long, long ago, like the nucleolus, for example, the nucleus was discovered, I think like 150 years ago, or the stress granules for sure, you know, dozens of years ago, they are not surrounded by membranes. People, researchers did not really know what is the physical basis of their formation? And it was just recently recognized that maybe this is this liquid-liquid phase separation that stands behind all this. It has become a big hype in recent years. There are really thousands of papers have addressed this, this uh, sort of issue. And it's also exciting, not only because it explains a lot about cell biology, but also because apparently it's, it is linked to disease. We heard in the introduction that that may be ALS, so amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, FTD, frontotemporal dementia, also called Lou Gehrig disease, but for sure other diseases as well uh, are linked to, to LLPS. Very briefly, this ALS FTD is a, <clears throat> is a progressive loss of, of, of muscles. It's a lethal disease. The survival is only a couple of years after the first symptoms and there's no cure. And the most famous sort of representatives of this disease is Lou Gehrig, who was a, a celebrity in the US, a very famous uh, a super athlete, uh, baseball player, <clears throat> who when he was diagnosed, he died a few years after. Stephen Hawking was a little, if you want, luckier with this thing because he lived many de or several decades with the disease. But, but ine inevitably, this leads to the death of motor neurons. So motor neurons that, that move, make our voluntary moves possible. Because in the, in the neurons, a lot of small aggregates, inclusions, uh, protein deposits appear. And the new field, you know, has the ambition of, of explaining this via the intermittent formation of phase, phase separation or liquid-liquid LLPS droplets. The idea being that, that certain proteins together with RNA, they can demix from solution to form these condensates, these droplets, such as stress granules or, or many others. And this is a completely physiological, normal, and reversible process. It can, it can come and it can go. But then something goes wrong. Maybe there are mutations in the protein. Maybe there are excessive stress, very long. Or maybe we are going, growing old as the fuzz age uh, intends to discover or to, to explore. So the protein does not go back into the solution state, but goes into some sort of aggregate. This accumulates in cells and apparently either kills the cells or at least signals or indicates that something is really terribly wrong with the cells. If we come back to phase separation now, whether it's uh, pathological or not, there's a quite simple way of describing the, the basic phenomenon. We, we, we call it spontaneous demixing of a protein from solution. The idea is that, that we can just describe with a phase diagram how the protein behaves outside this line that is called binodal or coexistence line. So for example, at lower, lower concentrations or higher temperature, the protein is in solution. But then if we cross the line, reach what, you, what is called saturation concentration and not critical concentration, that's something else. We reach saturation concentration, then the protein demixes from solution, forms two phases, a protein rich and a protein pure uh, phase. And as we proceed along the line, you know, higher and higher concentration, or we could go lower and lower temperature, and more, of, more, more and more of this uh, high density protein rich uh, phase forms until eventually after crossing again the line, we end up with, with having just the second phase, the, the concentrated phase. 
of course, with, with so for everyday usual protein solutions, this is pretty difficult to reach. We cannot really reach this, but this we can experience. There are good descriptions of the, of the simple theory behind this. Actually, it was polymer physicists, polymer chemists, who many decades, 50, 60 years ago, have described this phenomenon. They did not have in mind proteins at the time. It was just polymers. But they observed the same behavior with polymers. After all, proteins are just polymers, right? Biological polymers. And for example, this Flory Huggins theory or formalism pretty nicely describes what happens with a protein solution. And it operates with a couple of parameters. I'm not going into the detail. One is the volume fraction, that is concentration of the protein, you might say. And the other is the energy balance, balance between chain-chain interaction, chain solvent, so protein-protein interaction, protein-solvent interactions, and what is called mixing entropy. Because it's pretty clear that chain-chain interactions work for phase separation, there is chain solvent interaction and mixing entropy work against uh, phase separation. And when we go up with, with the concentration, the balance is tipped over or tilted and the protein starts to phase separate. So I showed you already this, the phase diagram like this. Sometimes it's the opposite. It just depends on which way the temperature, by temperature, the attractive term goes. For example, if there are hydrophobic interactions, they become stronger with temperature. And then we observe this kind of phase diagram. If you go down with the temperature is unfavorable, we go up, it's favorable for phase separation. But it's, it's just about the same. There are many famous or infamous proteins in this business. And even long before the LRPS phenomenon was, the, was sort of discovered and first described, these proteins were already known to be involved in cell biology and also in disease. Just, just to name a couple of them, this TDP43, the star DNA binding protein 43, is really a famous beast. It's involved not only in ALS, FTD, but almost all other neurodegenerative diseases, or fast fused in sarcoma, also involved in cancer, as the name in indicates, or heteronuclear ribonuclear proteins, uh, also involved in these. Two things to mention about these proteins. One is that they have a lot of mutations, these red dots. These are mutations that are causative in disease, so they are linked to familiar forms of the, of the disease. That's one thing. And the other thing is that very often these proteins have long disordered regions. These purplish you know, domains, if you wish, they are called low complexity domains. Sometimes they are called prion-like domains. And they are, they are bona fide IDRs, so intrinsically disordered regions. They don't have a well-defined structure. Sometimes the proteins have RNA binding domains, these blue things, because very often in the formation of these droplets, RNA is involved. So RNA binding is critical. But the, the message that I would just like to convey to you that, that most often they have long disordered regions. If we predict disorder by disorder predictors, this is charge density, but this is disorder prediction. For example, this HNRMPA2, you see that almost half the protein is disordered. Or TDP42, again, this second half of the protein, or here FUS, the first half, is intrinsic, intrinsically disordered. So actually when this whole field arose or came to existence, I, I had a very, very pleasant or good feeling because I felt that maybe this is one of the major reason why evolution has created or accepted or, or you know, uh, survived with, with protein disorder. Because these proteins can undergo phase separation and that provides for an, a new level, an additional layer of, of functionality to these proteins which does not occur at the level of the individual protein. We can no longer say what the function of a protein is, but what the function ascribed to an assembly or to a condensate. Uh, how can disordered proteins undergo phase separation? Well, it seems that the magic word, the key word is multivalency. And I just cite a few examples. I don't want to go into the detail of all these because they will actually come a little later back in my talk. but. The point is that almost invariably these proteins can, can realize interactions, can make interactions with other partners or with the same protein, another molecule of the same protein at multiple points. So that's multivalency. For example, a classic example uh, by Michael Rosen, actually that was one of the examples by which this whole field began. Uh, 
is, is nephrine, NWASP, and NCK, three proteins binding to each other. And you see on NWASP, there are proline-rich uh, short motifs, which are bound by the SH3 domain of NCK. And there are also phosphotyrosine binding. So there's a complex network of interactions enabled by multivalency. To, to name another example that will come back later on in my talk, is this protein, nucleo, nucleophosmine, that is a nucleolar protein. I, I told you that it was discovered 150 years ago that the, uh, the nucleolus uh, exists and, and, and this is, can be found in the nucleus. But now we think we understand sort of the physical basis of how it, it uh, uh, comes to existence. So this protein interacts via a domain, the pentamer is formed, and it has long disordered tails that have negative charges that can multivalently bind, bind by electrostatic interactions to a positive disordered partner. Or just to give you one more example, that will come back again, this DDX4, which is a, a, a RNA binding protein in uh, processing bodies, if I remember. It has a lot of positive charges, so arginines, a lot of aromatic residues like phenylalanines, and it was shown in very nice papers that the, the positive charges can bind to the aromatic rings by a cation pi interaction. So all these examples attest to the very fact that multivalence is very important to, uh, to phase separation, to the ability of proteins to undergo phase separation. And in one study that we have recently published, we wanted actually to understand the behavior, the general, you know, decisive behavior of these phase separating proteins. How can they be multivalent? How much disorder is? What kind of interactions they can realize? And because of that, we started a bioinformatics study in understanding LLPS proteins. Let's put it this way. And we went into the databases <clears throat> that are already there. So these are the four uh, databases that we have studied. Maybe there are already a fifth or sixth. And and we, we just looked into the databases. And there was something disturbing that in one database, for example, we found 120 proteins, whereas in the other, more than 9,000 proteins. And that really gave us you know, a strange feeling about what does it exactly mean that a protein is phase separating? Is it 100 proteins or is it 9,000 or something in between? So we started reading and thinking, and then we have come up in the paper, you can read all this, that there are some, I wouldn't say problems, it's not a good word, but there's some issues with LLPS. Of course, there's a lot of issues. These are just issues that we would like, or I would like to share with you. So the first layer or level is that the capacity to phase separate is not a binary classifier. So coming from the protein disorder field, we have come to sort of accept that Protein disorder is an intrinsic property, right? A, a protein or a region of a protein is either disordered or not. Whereas here with phase separation, we have to accept that phase separation is a contextual property of the protein and its environment. A protein can phase separate under one condition, but it will not in other. The other thing that also complicates things that proteins have distinct roles, I will come back to that in phase separation. The point number three maybe is related to one, but I wanted to highlight it, that phase separation is a concentration dependent phenomenon. Again, simply, we cannot say a protein phase separates, which we can only say that it phase separates above a certain concentration, but not below. And last but not least, which we are working on a manuscript, I will just, just, you know, in confidence between ourselves, I can just let you know that we were invited to write a kind of review in a very, very good journal. And that's the key point of that review is that LLPS, as everybody likes to call it, is not equivalent to biomolecular condensation because the condensation may include a lot of other things like gelation, crystallization, clustering, this pleomorphic assembly, all these that are not, not LLPS, not liquid phase separation. To give you just one example from that paper that might be coming up, if we come back to this nice uh, image that I already showed you, I would just like to point to this LLPS body, which is called synaptic densities. In, in the nerve cells, neurons, this is called postsynaptic density. And in a recent paper of ours, we have actually made this nice figure about the PSD, the postsynaptic density, based on literature data. And this looks something like this. 
So there's a lot of lot of domain domain interactions. There's a lot of kind of structural organization. True, this is very dynamic. So if you do FRAP experiments, fluorescence recovers very quickly, but it has what we might call a long range persistence or long persistence length. What does that mean? It means that if you have a liquid, it's very anisotropic. Actually, there is no correlation between the location and orientation of neighbors beyond or beside the first neighbor, right? In liquid, the first neighbors know about each other, but anything farther away is, um, is not, not correlated in its movement. So that's a liquid. Whereas the postsynaptic density is not a liquid. It has persistence over longer distances. It's non stoichiometric There's a lot of structure in it, a lot of dynamics as well. We should call it something else, not an LLPS body. And that's what we suggest in this maybe upcoming paper, a pleomorphic ensemble. Coming back to LLPS now, if you speak about LLPS, <clears throat> there's another range of, let's say, issues with LLPS, is that different proteins do different things in phase separation. Roughly, there are four categories, and we should not you know, mix them, and we should not study them together because these proteins behave different, they do different things. The first, of course, is drivers or scaffolds. These are the ones that really phase separate on their own. You have a solution of the isolated protein in the test tube, you change the temperature and it phase separates, that's a driver. If another macromolecule is required for phase separation, such as RNA or another protein, then we no longer can call that protein driver, but we can call the two proteins co-drivers because one cannot phase separate without the other. Again, it's, it's coming back to what I suggested, that phase separation is not an intrinsic property of just one protein or one macromolecule. It's a property of the molecule and its environment. By, this, by the same you know, uh, message, a co-driver is a macromolecule, as I suggested, that requires another macromolecule for phase separation. Then there are regulators. There are a lot of factors in the, in the cell, proteins mostly, the presence or activity of which is required for phase separation, but they are not part of the condensate or the phase separated body. For example, modifying enzymes. Very often in the literature, you find that this protein has to undergo post-translation modification to phase separate. Or there's a recent paper that, <clears throat> that sumoylation of certain proteins is required for the disassembly of stress granules. And, and those proteins that do simulation or dissimulation, they are regulated. So they have something to do with phase separation, but they don't phase separate on the board. And last but not least, there are also clients which somehow you know, travel with the phase separating bodies, they ride on them. They do not make phase separation happen, but they localize into them. And I'm telling all this because in cellular assays, for example, when, when people do a high throughput mass spec based proteomic analysis, of what phase separation body contains what proteins, it's pretty difficult to distinguish all these proteins. You have to have, or one has to have, additional lines of evidence. This is one of the reasons actually that easy. Uh, sorry, this is one of the reasons why in our study, we have seen that you know the databases differ. So in one, there is 100 proteins, and the other, there are 9,000 proteins, because these categories are mixed together. That's just a nice uh, figure from the literature about uh, uh, scaffolds and clients. I don't want to go into the detail. That was the original publication. Again, that, that shows how clients can, can use binding, uh, binding functionalities, binding uh, elements of, of the scaffolds and drivers. Okay, coming back to our study, <clears throat> I already sort of uh, told you the conclusion or the, the punchline of this, that when we compared all these databases, we found out that there's a little overlap between them. There are a lot of proteins like here, which apparently are clients, whereas here, these are apparently drivers, so they should not be mixed. So because of that, we have removed all data that are not drivers, and we use that sort of pipeline to come up with a, a sort of a, a mod modest number of, of human high confidence drivers. So in the paper, you can find papers, uh, sorry, proteins that have been identified to drive phase separation in human context, apparently both under in vitro and in vivo conditions. And then we started studying, I just would like to show you one interesting or intriguing result that we have made. 
that we compared for all these 89 uh, human driver proteins, we compared their concentration used in in vitro experiments and their concentration in cells. <laughs> their concentration in cells taken from this PaxDB uh, database. Of course, there are, you can read in the paper, there's a, like two pages of you know, discussion about this. So I don't want to claim that the simple conclusion that all these blues are much higher than all the yellows. So these proteins have been studied at higher concentration in the test tube than they are in the cell. So the LRPS behavior is not relevant. For sure, they are very relevant. I just would like to hi highlight that that's an issue about where we study phase separation in vitro, where we study in vivo, whether do we overexpression, whether do we have other factors, what are the conditions? So that's really something to take into consideration. But when we have taken a good look at these proteins that we have selected, we could sort of confirm, I wouldn't say find out, it was already found out in the literature, that what drives phase separation, I told you protein disorder is an important element, the co uh, multivalency is another important element. The third one is the kind of interactions between proteins that can be realized that actually make up multivalency. And these are the three or four basic types of protein-protein interactions that are realized in, in phase separation. The first one is IDP-IDP. It seems that disordered, disordered chains or tails of proteins can directly interact. I mentioned to you uh, cation pi interactions as a typical example of this. You just have to have an arginine residue and an aromatic ring, and they interact with each other. So these IDP-IDP interactions, they are transient, very dynamic, not too specific, non-stoichiometric, and they are distributed. At one type of IDP-IDP interaction is a little better defined. This is motive-motive interaction. You might remember them in the protein disorder field, we have, we have been talking a lot about short linear motifs, eukaryotic linear motifs, molecular recognition features, morph, all these things. So these are motifs and sometimes motif-motif interactions can be uh, realized between uh, disorder chains. Just to give you one example that comes, from, comes to mind, I showed you TDP43, that's an important phase separating protein also in disease. It, in its disordered tail, it, there is a, there's a helical region, a short motif, and it seems that the two helices, they can bind to each other, maybe even multiple helices in an amphipathic manner. And that's a kind of motif-motif interaction that really is important for the phase separation of the protein. Sometimes motifs are bound by domains. I showed you the example of, of uh, Michael Rosen about the NCK uh, wasp nephrine, where, pro, uh, pre, uh, sorry, uh, proline-rich regions are, are bound by SH3 domains. So these are stronger, more specific, and more stoichiometric. And of course, the most of these is domain-domain interactions. You remember the nucleophosmine, the pentamerization domain. That's a domain-domain interaction that somehow drives phase separation. So now we are almost sort of at the end of the story. What I would like to show you is three, three famous examples, how they provide evidence for all this, what I, have, what I have told, and also leads us to the functionality of, of phase separation, phase separating bodies. Because my conclusion is that, that if something is missing from this whole field, is really the functionality. Do we have some ideas about how these phase separated droplets function, but it's not really very conclusive and not very solid yet. So the first example, what I suggested is, is that, box, that box helicase from germ granules or nuage proteins, which I think in French means uh, cloud, if I remember, nuage. So this protein is a disordered protein, has a lot of positive charges, a lot of aromatic residues, and it has been shown in this, this really original, one of the breakthrough papers of the field that has come up of, of Julie Foreman case. I think it's not her lab, but, but by her contribution. And they have shown that this protein, if you, if you lower the temperature, it phase separates on the microscope, but it's reversible, right? We go back to temperature, it disappears. So it's pretty clear it's a liquid phase separation. It's fully reversible. The driving interaction is this positive aromatic ring interaction. So it's cation pi interaction. And it was also shown in that nice paper that charge distribution of the protein is also important because there's a secondary 
electrostatic interaction. So positive regions and negative regions, positive and negative, sorry, of the protein also drive interaction. Because when they scramble the sequence, so they abolish this, this uh, alternating charge pattern, the interaction phase separation disappeared. The other example I would like to mention that I already talked to you is nucleophosmine uh, coming of Richard Krivakis lab. So nucleophosmine is a nucleolar protein and it has this domain that pentamerizes but has this disordered charge tail that can interact with oppositely charged partners. <clears throat> and they are an important but not the sole component of, of uh, nucleoli because in the database that I showed you that contains thousands of protein hits, if I remember three or 4,000 proteins have been identified to be associated with, with the nucleoli. So that's a lot. It's not one phase separating body. It's not a homogeneous liquid droplet. It has multiple subregions. I mean, nucleoli, this fibrillar center, dense fibrillar component, granular component. So they are, it is structured in complicated ways. This interaction is just one element of this whole interaction. And what I would like to sort of emphasize that this whole thing is, is functionally in ribosome biogenesis. So where nucleoli are, ribosomal RNAs are transcribed. So from the DNA, RNA copies are made. Transcribed, all the ribosomal proteins are produced. And then they are assembled in a sequential manner through traveling through this alternative or through these different segments of the nucleoli. Again, it's a good question. You can read in the literature, it's a liquid droplet. It has a lot of features that, that, that are liquid-like, but it, there's more than liquid assembly or liquid uh, demixing to this whole story. And the third example I would like to mention is coming back that what I already suggested is signaling complex by Michael Rosen. In this original paper, it was shown that these three proteins, nephrin, NCK, and WASP, like I show it here, uh, form a complicated network of, of domain motif uh, interactions. So the, this protein nephrin has phosphotyrosine, it's phosphorated, it's a receptor protein, it's phosphorylated. So SH, SH, SH2 domains of NCK can bind to it, but NCK also has this SH3 domains that can bound to the proline rich regions of NWASP, another protein. And together they build up uh, quite a big uh, assembly under the membrane of cell membranes. It's a signaling complex that when it's active, it activates a protein complex that is called APR2. I think it's actin, actin promoting or actin related proteins, ARP, actin related proteins. And their primary function is to signal to cytoskeleton remodeling. So when it activates, it activates that, that APR or ARP23 and then, then actin polymerization, depolymerization commence. So having said all these, I would like to come to my sort of conclusion that I have shown you, especially on the, on the final three slides, that we, we sort of suspect, and we have started collecting evidence that this phase separation is really a functional phenomenon. So the droplets, in the droplet, the protein assembly has a different function than without the droplets. Just to name a few, uh, possible elements, it can give rise to inactivation of reactions because it separates components, or it can lead to activation, like this uh, previous example, the certain comp components are brought together in a droplet, so activity increases. It can buffer protein co concentrations because over a broad concentration range, the concentration outside and inside droplets stay the same, or the, the relative volume of the droplets change. They can generate pores, they can filter passing molecules, they can sense localization, they can sense environmental changes and conditions. So by having said all these, I think and I feel, and also good for fast age, this, that we are just at the beginning of understanding uh, how these phase separating bodies, the membraneless organelles function. There's a lot of things you know, to discover, to, to figure out. So it's really a challenge. But the punchline, the final line, line, what I would like to stress is this gives rise to an emergent function or emergent property of disordered proteins when no longer individual proteins are the functional units in the cell, but larger uh, assemblies of proteins or condensates of proteins. <clears throat>
And having said that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I think I'm on time and I'll be happy and ready to answer questions if they come. Thanks very much.